I have uh, just about uh, praised myself out already this morning, but I think I have just enough left. So uh, turn with me to uh, Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And uh, I want to read a few verses here beginning in verse number 1. Mark chapter 11 and verse number 1. Ready? Here we go. Mark 11, verse 1. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and he saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, the next village over, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt. Now, that word for colt actually means donkey. Okay? And in other uh, versions of this uh, from other gospel writers, they do use the word donkey. But I just wanted you to know that it's not a colt as in a horse, because that's what we usually think of. This is actually a donkey. They found a donkey tied whereon never man sat. And Jesus said, Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do you do this? Ye uh, say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way and found the colt, the donkey, tied by the door without in a place where two ways met. And they loosed him. And certain of them which uh, stood there said unto them, What do ye loosing the colt? They said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded. And so they let him go. The men, the disciples with the donkey, left. Verse 7 says, And they brought the donkey to Jesus, cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cast down branches. John's Gospel tells us those are palm branches. Palm branches signifying uh, the Prince of Peace, basically. Branches off the trees, strawed them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, what? Hosanna. Now, the choir has just been shouting that for about 30 minutes, right? So join with me. They cried out, what? Hosanna. You can do better than that. Come on now. You've been sitting for a long time. You got some energy built up. On three, they cried, one, two, three. There you go, Hosanna. And so they cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father, David, that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. What a blessing that Jesus went into Jerusalem for that final week of his life. How he went today is most significant to us. So, Lord, we just pray for your leadership, your wisdom, your words to speak today. Lord, we thank you for the music we've already heard that has lifted our hearts and got us now focused where you need us to be focused on your word. Take your word, take me your messenger just now. Use us together to speak truth in Jesus' name. Amen. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem for the final week before his crucifixion, the people shouted, Hosanna. Now this goes back to Psalm 118. And it is a part of what is known as the Hallel. Okay, in Hebrew they would say, Hallel, right? Because uh, in Hebrew and in Arabic and other uh, languages around that part, it sounds like when people are talking to each other, everybody's mad at each other. And they're, and they're spitting on each other all the time because you can't really do that very well without, I mean, 
Well, I would say try it, but then you'd spit on somebody in front of you. So don't try it, but, but uh, that's, the, that's what it is, the Jewish songbook known as the Hallel. And it would be sung, or these songs would be sung, which are recorded in the Psalms for us, as families headed to Jerusalem for the feasts. Many families would be making their way to Jerusalem at the same time Jesus was coming, as it was time to celebrate the Passover. They would have been singing, in this instance, Psalm 118, verses 24 through 26. They would have said, This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Does that sound familiar to what they were just talking about? What they, how they were just speaking? Yes, it, they have rendered that word then, Hosanna. And I believe they were singing this song at the top of their lungs, believing that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem to be their conquering king. He has told them, he has in Luke chapter 10, he sets his face as it is to go towards Jerusalem. Everything they are doing is heading toward Jerusalem. And the disciples, everybody following Jesus at this time, everybody that have laid their clothes down on the ground and put palm branches on the ground, they're shouting out, Hosanna in the highest, in the name of the Lord. They are expecting Jesus to ride into Jerusalem and to take over as the rightful king, the conquering king. The term Hosanna, if you were listening to the cantata a minute ago, means save us now, we pray. And so their shouts of Hosanna were justified, but a little misguided. The voices of the many disciples of Jesus echoed all the way down into the Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley is between the Mount of Olives and the eastern gate of Jerusalem. And so they shouted all the way down the Kidron Valley from the Mount of Olives and all the way back up to the eastern gate of the city of Jerusalem, right beside the temple. And that's why in Mark's gospel, verse 11 talks about the fact that the very first thing Jesus did is go into the temple. And what did he do? He started turning things over, dumping things out because the money changers were in there selling lambs for the Passover. It was a time of convenience for the people. But that's why the temple was in such great proximity for him to be able to do that first thing when he got into Jerusalem. Many must have been stirred by what we now call the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem the week prior to his death. And even though Jesus allowed this celebration and in fact, he even condoned it. Um, Luke's version of this in Luke 19 and verse 38. Luke's version, again, in Luke 19 and 38, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. When they were shouting Hosanna and welcoming Jesus in as their supposed conquering king, Verse 39 said, Some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. They're saying, like you might think of the ameniter in your aisle, would you please shut them up? You know, church has gotten way too quiet, in my opinion. I just think that uh, we need to be a little bit excited about what the Lord does. I mean, if we get excited when the home team scores a touchdown and jump up, yell, and scream. Can't we get excited a little bit about the Lord? At least a couple of days a week. Amen, man. Let's get into it. All right, so the Pharisees were what we have kind of become in church. They're the ones that want the silent majority. Right? 
Shut those guys up. They're shouting, Hosanna. We don't know what they're expecting. And, of course, the, the Pharisees have had the wrong idea about Jesus all along anyway. And so they're saying, hey, you need to make them be quiet. Rebuke thy disciples is what they, what they said to Jesus. But Jesus answered and said unto them in verse 40, I tell you that if these people should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. The very creation would have cried out and welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem for what ultimately would be this final week of his life. As he knows what he's going into Jerusalem to do. But at this point, everybody else is just a little bit misguided. And then it says in verse 41. When Jesus was come near, he beheld the city. And he wept over it. Having been in Jerusalem three years ago. Jerusalem is certainly still a city worth weeping over. And then he said in verse 42, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least, in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. But now they are hid from thine eyes. Jesus allowed the people to shout, Hosanna, save us now, we pray, and even condoned it. But there seems to be a bit of a disconnect between the assumptions of the disciples and Jesus in his words right here. Jesus was coming to Jerusalem and he had a task in mind, did he not? Jesus was coming with a purpose. But as happens so many times, unfortunately, his plan was not the people's plan. So here's the plan. For the people shouting, save us now we pray, we can be certain they were expecting some sort of a battle. The powers that be that would be the Romans and the Jewish religious leaders together were not just going to go away because Jesus was coming to town. Not only were the words Jesus spoke puzzling then, but so also was his mode of transportation particularly picked out. Did you note in Mark's gospel that he said, I want you to go into town where the two ways meet. You'll find a donkey that's never been ridden on. Loose him, bring him to me. There is a specific task and a specific animal waiting for Jesus. He rode into town from the Mount of Olives down the Kidron Valley, up the hill and into the eastern gate, just beside the temple, on a donkey. First of all, this donkey we know had never had anybody ride on it before. Which, in Jewish culture meant that this animal was suitable for holy purposes. That was very important because was not Jesus about to accomplish a holy purpose? We know now because we can look back and see what he was doing, but at that point in time, I'm sure everybody was kind of going, wait a second here. But at least they knew that this was a donkey that no one had ever ridden on before. Then, as predicted in Zechariah's prophecy, and if you have your Bibles, you want to turn there. If not, look up on the screen to Zechariah chapter 9, 
verses 8 and 9, just as Zechariah's prophecy foretold, Jesus rides in on a donkey, not on a horse. You see, we sure don't have time to get into it today, but I will give you the illustration and then the um, interpretation of what verse 8 is talking about. It is linking in with Daniel's prophecy of a leopard that would sweep across the known land and conquer. And verse 8 of Zechariah 9 says, And I will encamp about mine house because of the army, because of him that passeth by. And because of him that returneth, and no oppressor shall pass through them any more, for now have I seen with mine eyes. Verse 8 links up with Daniel in a prophecy of what Alexander the Great does. And Alexander the Great is uh, depicted as the leopard in Daniel's prophecy. And uh, he conquered the known land, including the culture that Zechariah was living in at the time, the Medo-Persia Empire, in four years. Conquered the whole known land. That's without tanks, airplanes, and all of the, our known armies today. Without any transport vehicles from 334 to 330 B.C., Alexander the Great comes in and takes over the world. Now what chapter, what Zechariah is talking about there in verse 8 is the fact that under providential care, and you can look this up in your history books, Alexander the Great left Israel alone. He miraculously passed right by it on the borders, kind of around the Jordan River, went down, conquered Egypt, and came back up in the same route and left Israel totally alone, even though they were super vulnerable at the time. So Alexander the Great, the other very significant thing about him in regards to the following verse, verse 9, is Alexander the Great rode a very famous horse. This horse that Alexander the Great rode's name was Bucephalus. Say that real fast. Or not. You might lose some falsies if you got them. Bucephalus. That was the name of his horse. And he came by Bucephalus, this beautiful black horse, when he was very young. In fact, at the age of 12. A man came to Alexander the Great's dad, who was Philip II, and offered this beautiful stallion to him for a very high price. There was only one problem. The horse hated everybody. In fact, the horse was known to go after people and bite them. And legend has it that the horse went after Philip II and tried to bite him, if not getting or having some success. And so, of course, Philip II said, uh-uh, I'm not taking that horse. And Alexander the Great, as a 12-year-old, stepped up and said, I think I want him. And he went over and he tamed that horse. And he, in all of his conquerings, would ride that big black stallion. And everywhere that Alexander the Great went, Bucephalus went with him. Just like Roy Rogers and who? There you go. I mean, there was this connection there. And I'm sure that when that big black stallion and that man on him started coming to town, everybody knew Alexander the Great was here and he was coming to conquer. It was bad news to see that big black horse and that rider. Because you ride a horse in to conquer. Zechariah's prophecy goes on to say in verse 8, or verse 9, excuse me. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. 
Behold, the king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, a donkey, and upon the colt, the foal of a donkey. In other words, he rode on a donkey that had never been ridden on before. In this culture, when a man rides in on a horse, he's coming to conquer. But when he rides in on a donkey, it means he's coming in with peace in his heart. With peace in his mind. Only if they were to come in on a horse would they be coming in to conquer, just as Alexander the Great did in four short years. But Jesus was not riding into Jerusalem on a horse like that. No, he was coming in on this donkey. Don't you know, don't you think at some point, somebody in this crowd of disciples hollering out, Hosanna, save us now, we pray, must have thought, aren't conquerors supposed to come in on a horse Aren't they supposed to ride in like Alexander the Great did just 300 years ago on horses like Bucephalus? Therefore, we must know that the plan was, as Luke's gospel tells us, for peace. It was not for conquering. That's coming. It was for peace at this time. And that's why Jesus said in Luke 19, 42, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. Even though the people wanted Jesus to immediately come in and set up his earthly throne, Jesus had a far more important plan for you and for me. This plan was for peace. May I tell you what that word peace means right there? It means to set at one again. That's what it means, to set at one again. So, this was a peace that only Jesus could bring. His plan for peace was to give His life on the cross, shedding His blood for the cleansing of our sin, so that by believing in Him, we could be set at one again with God. There is a separation between sinful man and holy God. And Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on this day on a donkey to create the peace, to mediate peace between God and man. Only Jesus could bring such peace because He was the only one who ever lived a perfect life and completely obeyed God's words, laws, and commands. He did so with this plan to bring peace between you, me, and God. He wanted us to be one again with God. Therefore, He provided. A few days later, Jesus would willingly give His own life for us by dying on the cross. The earth would stand still at this moment in time as He hung there between heaven and earth. The only one who could mediate between sinful man and holy God. He mustered up the last breath and power to speak as He proclaimed, It is finished. 
The Bible says, then he bowed his head and he died in the darkness of the day. But ladies and gentlemen, teenagers, boys and girls, the darkness of that day was replaced by the glorious light of the morning of the third day. When the faithful ladies came to properly embalm his body, they were met with the angels who proclaimed, He is not here. He is risen. He is risen from the dead. God was completely satisfied with what Jesus had done. His plan for peace was successful. And God raised His Son Jesus from the dead. The Son that rode in seven days prior on the donkey. And everybody went, wait a minute, what in the world is going on here? I thought He was coming in to conquer. Nope. His plan was for peace. His plan was so that he could bring peace between you and me and God. And he did so faithfully, completely, when he died on the cross. And that is the reason God raised his son from the dead, through his faithfulness. So he rose triumphant, and in the process... He conquered death, hell, and the grave. So His plan for our peace with God is now and will always be complete. That's why Jesus said, it is finished. Nobody ever has to come and do this again. I have completed the task that my Father had for me to complete. It is is finished. So our belief in Him and what He has done for us brings about the same peace that we see as Jesus rode into Jerusalem to provide that day. Were they wrong to shout Hosanna? No, not at all. Were they misguided at the time? A little bit. Because Jesus came in not as the conqueror, but as the one to bring peace between God and man. May I remind you one thing. Revelation 19 tells us, that Jesus is coming again. You know that, right? Jesus is coming again. And the second time He comes, Revelation 19 tells us, He rides in on a white horse. Alexander the Great had the black horse. Jesus, our conquering Savior, is going to ride in on a white horse. This time all the world will know and see he's not coming in on the donkey. It's not for peaceful reasons this time. It's because he is coming to conquer. He is coming to rule and reign in righteousness. And he will conquer sin at that point in time on the earth. But that's coming. That's in the future. The moment we are most concerned with today is that He came the first time to bring peace, to set you and I at one again with God. So have you believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior today? That is what it takes to know this peace, to be set at one again. To believe what Jesus has done. Have you believed in Him as Savior? Let me ask you this. Are you living for Him as your Savior? And following Him as your Lord? 
Is He your God? Boy, today there are so many gods out there to follow. So many temptations to put someone or something else in front of God. We just can't do that. And especially if you know Jesus, may today be a day of recommitment and rededication. Today needs to be a day of action.